Uh, and it's good to be in the Lord's house this morning. Uh, before uh, the Lord uh, uh, turns me loose on His Word, um, I, I do, I do want to uh, share a moment with you. Uh, Sister Sharon, would you please come up real quick? Uh, give her a hand as she does that. Merry Christmas. Christmas. To those who don't know me, my name is Sharon Hagerman, and probably for the last two years I've been going backwards and forwards to England to witness to my family. And I got a call this morning from my sister, and she accepted the Lord into her heart this morning. <laughs> so now we just still got to work on my dad, and I want to thank everyone for your prayers. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's Christmas. That is Christmas. Christmas is Jesus alive in your heart. Christmas can happen every day when Jesus is in your heart. Sharon didn't tell you this, but her sister was uh, a professed atheist. Her sister would pick on her for her faith. But her sister now is a believer. It's a miracle. That's a Christmas miracle. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, there is power in prayer. And there's power in the love that Jesus has put inside of us. Amen. If you would take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to read this uh, chapter together. I won't hold you too long this morning. we got toys to play with, food to eat, family to see and visit with. Uh, but this is very important, uh, the retelling of the birth of our Lord and Savior and uh, of wise men from the East. It's very important things here. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, and it says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, the old wise men from the East came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judea, for out of you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, 
was exceedingly angry, and it sent forth and put to death all male children who were in Bethlehem and all its dis, uh, districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside to the region of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled that he that was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus, and we thank you for uh, all of our family and friends, all the things you've blessed us with. But Lord, most importantly, we, we ask that everyone here can proclaim very boldly that they have Jesus, the greatest gift on earth in their hearts. God, I pray right now, Lord, that you would move my flesh aside, let the very spirit of Jesus minister to every heart and mine here. God, that we would not leave unchanged here, but Father, that you would perform surgery upon our hearts and minds right now. Lord, that we may be in your image. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, church, Christmas is a really fun time, an amazing time, a great time, uh, but it's also a very hard time for some families. Uh, some, some people go through uh, different things, various things. Uh, some people just remember the people that they've lost at times. Uh, but a, a father called his son uh, not too long ago, and he's like, son, I'm done with your mother. After 45 years of marriage, I'm tired of her talking, I'm tired of her breathing, I'm tired of just being in her presence. And his son was taken aback by it because it is near Christmas and they've been married for 45 years seemingly happily. And he's like, Father, are, are you sure what you're saying is true? And he goes, yeah, I just cannot stand her anymore. And he says, and don't tell your sister because I don't want her calling over here and us getting an argument. And so as soon as he hung up, you know what the son did? <laughs> Call his sister. That's what we do. Amen. He calls his sister who's in Hong Kong at the time. He's like, sister. Mom and dad are getting a divorce. He says that he can't even stand mama breathing anymore. And, and she was so infuriated that she called her dad and was like, Daddy, what are you talking about? You've been married for 45 years. Why are you just going to end it right now? He goes, well, honey, I'm just tired of arguing. I'm tired of fighting. I'm just tired of her. I don't want to see her anymore. And she doesn't want to see me anymore. And she says, Daddy, don't you do another thing until we get there. We're both coming to see you. We're going to fix this as a family. And he hung up the phone and he turned to his wife and he said, baby, it worked. They'll be home for Christmas. <laughs> right? Oh. Isn't it bad? You got to make people think something bad's going on. Just see somebody sometimes. Right? That's what we kind of do with God sometimes. Man, when things are great, things are great. And we don't need God because things are great. When things aren't always great though. We'll go through seasons. We'll go through really trying seasons sometimes. And listen, we will need God. We'll need Him badly. And you can try to fill that void with so many other things. And, and listen, that void will never be filled. You could put the world inside of it and it would still be hungry after the world. But Jesus satisfies the soul. He satisfies our longings and our needs. The question are, are you aware of the presence of Jesus? You know, uh, in the Old Testament, one of my, my favorite scriptures is Jeremiah 29, 11. How many of y'all know that by heart? Jeremiah 29, 11. Amen. And we really focus on it, but that, that scripture says, for surely I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your good, not for your what? Your harm, not for evil. To give you a future with what? With hope. A good future. I want to read you it in context, though, because when Jeremiah received this prophecy, he received it to a people who were rejecting God. And God was going to bring punishment on the Israelites, 
And so uh, the prophet Jeremiah said, For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you. They were going to be in a captivity for 70 years. 70 years away from their temple. 70 years away from the, the, the Jerusalem. It wasn't until 70 years later till a king, a foreign king, let them come back and rebuild their temple, rebuild their walls. But God said, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare, not for your harm, to give you a future with a hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. And when you search for me, you will find me. When you seek me with what? All of your heart. You know what? God doesn't play hide and seek with us. I mean, if He played hide and seek with us, He would win every time. If God doesn't want His presence to be around, it's gone. Israel did not want His presence. And so listen, for 400 years, there was no prophet giving God's Word because God was silent. And that silence was broken by the cry of a baby in a manger. God left the people as quietly as He entered back into the world. Very quietly. Very quietly. There wasn't big pop and circumstance for our Lord and Savior, the King of Kings. He just came in the very lowly form of a baby. God was entrusting Himself in human hands. Babies, you can't get more needy than a baby. Any of y'all ever have these things called babies? They just need constantly. They need your protection. They need your provision. They need your love constantly. God placed Himself in the hands of mankind. It's very beautiful. Jeremiah 29.11 says that God wishes to give us a future with what? A hope. I want to tell you that the more literal Hebrew translation is this, an end with hope. I like, how many of y'all like reading books? Any books? Some people, some of you people, y'all have to look at the last chapter before you read a book. I don't understand some of y'all who just don't like be surprised. But I guess some of you just don't want to waste the time in reading the book. But you want a what kind of an ending? A happy ending. Amen? I mean, who, who wants to like read this like 800-page book with a bad ending, right? I mean, who wants to do that? And how many of y'all, do y'all want to live a full life but with a bad ending? Who wants that? Because we'll talk right after service if you want that. <laughs> We're going to have a talk. Because listen, every one of us wants a what kind of an ending? Happy ending. Amen? Every single one of us wants an ending that is happy. God wants you to have a hopeful end. He wants the last chapter in your book to read, and they lived happily ever after. No, no, no. It's better than that. It's better than that. God wants the last in your chapter to say, eternal life with Jesus. Amen. That is a happy ending. But church, the happy ending that, that the world needs is being hidden by so much darkness. But God has put us, the church, as the light of the world. But to find that light, you must seek it with all your heart. And when you have that light, you must fight to keep it, to keep your flame burning bright. At church, we have uh, this really amazing story. Jesus had already been alive a year or two by this time when the the wise men show up on scene. But it's very wonderful how it takes place because when they show up, where do they show up first when they get to that area? They go to Jerusalem. And this is so interesting. It says in this chapter that when they get there, they begin to ask, where is the king that was to be born of the Jews? And they're asking everybody. And when Herod the king heard about this, it says that he was what? Troubled. And so was all Jerusalem with him. Look at verse 2 there. Excuse me, verse 3. Look at that. He was troubled in all of Jerusalem, and when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. He was, he was intrigued by this statement, and it was, it was troubling, because if there was a king born of the Jews, who, who should know about it? 
Well, the Jews. This is why they were troubled, because these strangers came from a different place, believing the Word of God. And as they came into this area, they're asking them where their king is, because surely these people would know. Another reason why they'd stop by Jerusalem, if you're coming from the east, which the star arose in the east, and they followed the star from the east, how, how does one do that? It means the star to them was moving. It was leading them. And so they followed the star, and if you're traveling east to Jerusalem, before you get to Bethlehem, you're going to have to go through Jerusalem. This is the city of kings. Why wouldn't the king be in Jerusalem? But they get there and they run into this guy named King Herod. He had much different ideas about the king. What kind of a man was King Herod? I want to tell you that the young King Herod, he, he was actually uh, an inspiring leader. He had this one idea that he wanted to restore Israel and that Israel wouldn't be slaves and that he could live comfortably. That's kind of what his goal was. He wanted to make sure his people weren't slaves and that he could live comfortably. He actually married a woman who was a royal line to legitimize his, uh, uh, his kingship. And he became essentially a puppet to the Roman Empire for a while there. And he was fine because his people weren't in slavery and he was comfortable. And so here comes these guys saying that there is a king born to the Jews. And that threatens his people, supposedly. But it also affects his what? Comfort. I'm the king. I haven't heard about this. And you know what he turns to? He turns to God's word doesn't he? He calls the prophets. He, calls the, he turns to God's Word. Here we have some men seeking Jesus with all their heart. The wise men, they're seeking Jesus with all their heart. Well, guess what? Herod's seeking Jesus now with all his heart. But they have very, very different intentions regarding Jesus, don't they? Do you know that when people gather together, everyone has different intentions at times? See, our one intention should be to worship. It should be to give our best, our all. And these men, they bore gifts, didn't they? What did they bring? Gold, frankincense, and what? Myrrh. Go ahead and say it loud. We want the Methodists to hear us. Right? <laughs> right go ahead and say it. So they brought what kind of gifts? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Right? Those are the three gifts and so we say that there's three wise men, but we really don't know. All we know is that they brought these three gifts. They were significant enough that Matthew recorded them. But I want to tell you this. Before they gave the king of kings those gifts, before they did any of that, they bowed down and they did what? They worshipped him. Before they gave Jesus gifts, they acknowledged his presence as king and as savior. You know what sometimes we do? Before we even acknowledge God's presence and our position, you know what we'll do? We'll ask for gifts and we'll try to give gifts before we even acknowledge God's presence. We will acknowledge, we, we won't acknowledge God, but we'll acknowledge the gift. Sometimes we'll even worship the creations and not the Creator. And these were these three men. But how did Herod get to a point to where he could just order the death of children under two? You see, that gold, what was that, that gold that they gave him? That gold that was a precious metal for kings, right? The, the, theologians have, have aspired different roles for those gifts. And gold is a kingly gift. Jesus is the king of kings. The three wise men acknowledged Jesus as king, didn't they? Who was Herod's king? Himself. You see, Herod, to keep his power, he killed two of his sons and the wife he married keep his power. His king or his master 
was himself, his pride. Jesus said this, man cannot serve what? Two masters. I just want to ask you just a straight question. Is Jesus your king? Is he your king? Is he who you would give your gold to? Your king? Would you give your king the most precious thing in the world? It's your heart. Is he your king? They brought gold and what else did they bring? Frankincense which is a, an anointing resin, an oily resin. Priests would use this to anoint during services. Well, well church, Jesus is our great high priest. Amen. Because of Jesus, we don't need any other mediator between Amen. us and God. Amen. We don't need a, a priest. We don't need the Pope. We don't need a pastor. We don't need a church. All you need is a heart that seeks God out. And you're there in the presence of God. You know what I can't stand sometimes is when people come to me and they're like, Pastor, I met somebody. I'm trying to lead him to the Lord. So I want you to go and witness to him. And I almost want to look at them and it's like, who are you? Did Jesus not save you? Did Jesus not clean you out and give you a new life and a testimony to tell somebody what Jesus did for you? Because I can't tell them what Jesus did for you. I can tell them what Jesus did for me. But the greatest testimony on this planet and the greatest weapon that we have is our testimonies. And if we're not sharing this testimony, we are really missing out. We're missing out on seeing people except a king, except a high priest. You see, Herod really wasn't religious. He had a, a position that required a religiosity. But he wasn't a religious person, nor I believe he feared judgment. Herod was his own God. And you know what this culture that we live in kind of plays out a little bit is that you are your own God a little bit. What is right for you is right. What is truth for you is truth. But that's not truth. Truth is absolute. You see, without an absolute, there would really be no morality. There would really be no evil. There would really be no good. It's just everybody does what they want to. And would you really want to live in a place like that? We're kind of living in a place like that, aren't we? Who is your high priest? Who is your faith founded upon? Is it Jesus? And finally, we have gold, frankincense, and what? Myrrh, which was also another resin used for burial rituals. Uh, twice in the Old Testament, it's mentioned in Genesis when Joseph is being sold by his brothers. The guys who purchased him into slavery were selling resins like that. Well, this is very interesting, right? And another time is in Exodus is when they anointed the tent of meeting where Moses would come and speak to God face to face. And here they bring Jesus myrrh. Jesus was born to die. He was born to die for men like Herod. He was born to die for you and I. And listen, Christians, you and I were born to die. We all have an appointed time. But you see, Jesus didn't just die. Jesus was raised again. And for those of us who are born again, as Jesus is born in the Spirit, as we can be born in the Spirit, there is no death. Death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? It has been swallowed up by life. And that is our Jesus. That is our Savior. These wise men, they had it down. They weren't trained in the Scriptures as these priests and these prophets were, but they believed they had a hope. And listen, 
they traveled for nearly two years looking for just a thought and a hope. I mean, how many of us would just wander around following a star, not knowing where it's really taking us, for two years? These guys gave up their life for two years. How many, I mean, don't you think they were probably married? Hey, baby, uh, I'm going to follow a star. I don't know when I'm going to be home. What would your woman say to you? Well, the locks might be different when you come home. Or you better send that paycheck. <laughs> right? They left on a hope. That's faith. Man, some of us can't stick to something for more than two weeks. Some of us get angry at God when we pray for a week over something and we're like, you're not listening and I give up. But these guys walk two, about two years chasing something they would have never seen with their eyes. They just believed in their hearts. There's this uh, Catholic priest that was called... Uh, now, this is very tough. He was a Belgian Catholic priest in 1873. He was called to Hawaii. How many of you wish that you were a missionary? You're like, oh man, I'm going to suffer for the Lord. I'm being called to Hawaii. Well, he was called to a small island called Molokai. Molokai, which is very interesting though. He wasn't going to have a, a fairly a beautiful time there. You see, he was going to minister and evangelize two lepers. Molokai had a leper colony there of a little over 100 lepers. And when he got there, he began to minister to these people, and he was trying to reach out to them, uh, love on them, show them the love of Christ. But when he would try to connect with some of the people, they treated him like he had leprosy. They didn't want to get around him. They didn't want to hear him. They didn't want to talk to him. And listen, he was there for 12 years without a single convert. Not a single convert for 12 years. And he, by the 12th year, that's when he got to, like, it was like, all right, I am no use here. And he wrote a letter to his, uh, the, the people over him. He's like, I, I feel like it's time for me to come home. I'm here to, for 12 years. These people who have a skin disease that's killing them, they won't even let me near them and minister to them. And so as he is waiting on his ship to go home, he looks down at his hands and he saw something that he knew what it was. He had contracted leprosy. And God spoke to him. And he left the dock and went back. And he told the people. And then word began to spread around that the priest who had been trying to minister to us for 12 years has leprosy now. That Sunday morning after the word got out, there was standing room only in the chapel. You see, when he came to them, he came to them as an outsider. He came to them as somebody who was better than them because he didn't have no skin disease. All he was trying to do was sell them some type of love, sell them some type of religion. But you see, this man was willing to take on their skin disease, their flesh, and live among them. And they loved him now because he was one of them. Jesus took on our flesh and lived among us to show us He loves us. God, He sent His law. He sent His prophets. He sent His kings. He sent His people. He sent His Spirit on people to move them and inspire them. And none of that was enough. We just wouldn't get it. We kept on rebelling and rebelling and rebelling until God was like, I, I will show them I love them. I will take on a heart that beats. I will take on lungs that fill my uh, body with air. I will become one of them. And I will show them that I love them. He showed us. You know what God wishes us and desires us? To love Him. To choose to love Him. He was in our skin. I think that 
the least we could do is to give our flesh to Him and our hearts to Him. Because He was willing to take it all for us. And He is, if you would just be willing to seek Him with all of your hearts, you will find Him. Would you please stand as we go to Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time and this moment. And Lord, I thank You so much that You took on our skin, our flesh, our blood and bones, Lord, that we may love You, but more importantly, that You would show us that You love us and You loved us first. God, as we go into this time of invitation, Lord, I pray if there's anyone here this morning that has not made You their King, that has not made You their High Priest, that has not uh, understood Your sacrifice and the resurrection, Lord, may it all come together this morning, Lord, that they would receive You today. Lord, that we may celebrate a Christmas that takes place in the heart of a person. And we thank You for this time and this moment. We love You, Lord Jesus. Thank You so much for what You do. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen and amen.